Hi there, everyone. My name is Max, and I'd like to thank you all on behalf of Roman's Bookstore for tuning into tonight's event. Tonight, we're lucky to have with us Chris Gardner, who will be in conversation with me discussing his new book, Permission to Dream. Chris Gardner is the chief executive of Gardner Rich & Company, a multi-million dollar brokerage with offices in New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. An avid philanthropist and motivational speaker, Gardner is committed to many organizations, particularly those related to education, and was recently the recipient of the Father of the Year Award from the National Fatherhood Initiative. A Milwaukee native, Gardner has two children and resides in Chicago and New York. So Chris and I will be, you know, just talking, asking each other questions. Um, but if at any point in tonight's event you do want to ask Chris a question, go ahead and just put it in the chat on the side, and we'll go ahead and talk about it. Uh, and if you would like to purchase his book, Permission to Dream, you can go ahead and click that name button down below and it will take you to our website where you can buy it from us. Uh, but with that all out of the way, Chris, thank you for being here tonight. It's so great to have you. No, man, it's good to be with you, Max. Thank you. I thank all the folks at Vormans for, for making this happen. Yeah, uh, of this course. Is a big deal we're, for me. we're really happy to have you. You're an incredible author, a very impressive person, and like we're just so honored. Well, I, I've got to tell you, man, uh, this is a big deal for me because is small businesses, independent bookstores like yours that contributed to the success of the first book, The Pursuit of Happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that just kind of happened. Let, let's talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. That came out the same time the film did, let's say uh, 2007, because the film was released in December of 2006. The world changed right after that. Think about it for a second. The film was released December of 2006. January 2007, economists started asking, is the US economy going into a recession? Spring of 2008 is officially acknowledged as the beginning of the global financial crises. All or too many of the young people who went away to college in 2008 saying, yes, we can. They came out four years later saying, what the? Huh? Max, I did everything I was told to do. I went to school. I got good grades. I graduated. But now the world has changed so much. I got little to no opportunity to be in the business or industry that I wanted to be in. And now I got to move back in the house with mom and dad. And mom and dad haven't lost the house. My point is, it was independent bookstores in that environment that made that book happen. Now, it didn't hurt that I had the biggest movie star in the world playing me in a movie. <laughs> yeah, that's a good little side note. <laughs> and that didn't help. Didn't hurt at all. <clears throat> but I, I've got to say, I said all of that to say this. Spending time with you and your folks in Pasadena and at Vormans right now is so important to me because we're in a position now that we can direct traffic flow a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as say bulk purchases for my new book, The Permission to Dream come, I'm directing all those orders to independent bookstores as much as I can. Thank you. And you know, we just appreciate that so much. Like we could not do this without you. We wouldn't be here. Oh man, are you kidding me? I couldn't do this without you and every independent bookseller in the country. The big boxes, okay, that, that's great, okay? There's a place for that. Uh, there's a place for the, the Amazons of the world. But before them, in my mind, there's the independent booksellers and independent book, you know, houses like yours that make it work. So, Again, I said all of that to say this. I'm absolutely honored to be here with you tonight. Well, thank you so much, Chris. So I will go ahead and just throw a quick, easy question out there. How's life been during the pandemic? How have you been dealing with it? Back. <laughs> what you just said. Quick, easy question. <laughs> How you been doing during the pandemic? <laughs> Man. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me, okay, Max. Okay, this is just me and you talking now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Honestly, let me say this. Whew, man, 2020, did that catch us all off guard or what? 
Mm -hmm. The last major public speaking event that I did in 2020, February 12th, 2020, the venue was the United Nations. I was invited to a speak at the United Nations. They were beginning to try and answer this question of how do we begin to address global homelessness? My point is a couple. Number one, man, that was February 12th, 2020. COVID-19 was already here, Max. Mm -hmm. Just didn't know it. Yeah. And one of the, the questions that I raised, which I think was a big question, was how do we first of all begin to redefine who is at risk of becoming homeless to include working women? Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, in too many places and businesses, women are still paid less than their male colleagues. Mm -hmm. And in certain markets, Los Angeles, San Francisco, among other major metropolitan areas, these women, Max, have a very quiet fear. And the quiet fear is, what if something happens? What if I lost my job? What if my husband lost his job? What if there was some economic gyration that occurred someplace around the world that had nothing to do with me, but suddenly we're all at risk? My point again, Max, is, man, I asked that question February 12th, 2020, and look where we are now. Yeah. So you say, how have I been during the pandemic? Okay, uh, let me tell you something. I made the hard pivot, Max. We all had to make what I call a hard pivot. One of the things we talk about in the new book, Permission to Dream, is this hard pivot. And a hard pivot being defined as something you would have never chosen, but you still got to make it work. That's where we all are right now. At the beginning of this pandemic, I was trying to uh, help my granddaughter understand where we all are. The best analogy I could come up with, Max, was that of an earthquake. Hmm. Earthquake that shook the entire planet at the same time. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, to take it a little bit further, you talk about this, this thing that hit us all at once. And Max, at the beginning of this pandemic, a lot of people were saying, well, we're all in the same boat now. And I will submit to you, no, sir, we're not in the same yeah. boat. We are in the same storm. <laughs> yeah. Max, yeah. Max, think about it. There's a few different boats out here right now. Mm -hmm. There's a boat full of people who have the luxury of working from home. Mm -hmm. with whatever issues and challenges that presents, which is totally separate from the boats full of first responders, essential employees, and healthcare workers that must put their health and their family's health at risk to go to work, which is totally separate from the boats full of tens of millions of people who know there's no work for them to go back to. And Max, there's another boat out there. There's a boat full of people who don't believe that we are in a storm. There unfortunately is, yeah. Okay, so yeah. no, we're not <clears throat> in the same boat. We're in the same storm. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah, I never thought of it like that. Yeah, yeah. so that's where we are. And I'll tell you three things that are certain about this space we're in right now, Max. Number one, We've all had our worlds rock at the very same time. Mm -hmm. Number two, none of us knows how long these new changes are going to be with us. And number three, we're all going to come out of this with new scar tissue. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it play out individually, institutionally, locally, and globally. Undoubtedly, yeah. It's a completely different world than before. Totally. And we don't know for how long, Max. Mm -mm. Now, the other side of it is, Max, 
this is going to happen again. You think pandemic wise or just a global happening? Yes, sir. I spent my entire career on Wall Street. And there's one rule. If it happened once, it's going to happen again. So that begs the bigger question of what did we all learn in 2020 that we're going to have in our quiver, in our toolbox, mm -hmm. in our on our tool belt that we can use the next time this all happens again? And mm -hmm. that, again, is something that we talk about in the book, Permission to Dream. But it's so interesting, Max, that book was began to be uh, in my mind four years ago. Four years ago, as a result, uh, a walk. I got stranded in the worst snowstorm in history on the wrong side of Chicago with my then nine-year-old granddaughter because she wanted to learn how to play the harmonica. I see the guitar in your room. You're a musician. Yeah. Appreciate this. She didn't just want a harmonica, Max. She wanted the Ferrari of harmonicas. <laughs> okay? And <laughs> as a musician, you will appreciate there's certain places that you can go that you have to go to get certain things. Yeah. You can't just get them anywhere. So there's a music store on the wrong side of Chicago. We go in the store. I tell the cabbie, you wait right here. We'll be right out. We're just going to go in here, get this thing, and we're out. Well, guess what, Max? We come out, and the cab is gone. So now we got to walk. Yeah. OK? We start walking home. And my granddaughter, out of nowhere, looks up at me, and she says, Papa, what's the difference between a dream and a plan? Oof. Dude, that's a big question. What's the difference between a dream and a plan? And this whole conversation turned into this book, Permission to Dream. This was a conversation between my granddaughter and I. And I kept saying in my mind, what if this was the last conversation that you were going to have with the person you love more than anything in the world, what would you want them to know about where we're from, where we are, and where we're going? What would you say? So this book, this whole idea of permission to dream is me sharing not just with her, but with a whole new generation of young people all around the world, and all people, truly, because dreams don't have expiration dates, Max. Mm -mm. Okay? Unless you choose. Yeah. If you choose to, then that's on you, Max. Okay? So this whole idea of permission to dream, I've got to tell you, Max, we made a conscious decision. We were not going to release the book in 2020. The book was ready to go. But we made the decision that no, you can't release anything right now into this toxicity yeah. of 2020. Yeah. Nothing about positivity and going forward. You wouldn't get any airtime whatsoever. Mm -mm. Right? So this is the time. And I got to tell you, man, we're tremendously excited about it. Uh, it fits in perfectly, Max, with what I'm doing with my life right now. Uh, I'm living what I'm very comfortable calling the JFK moment of my life. And just a little bit about that. I will never forget being a, a little boy, Max, and hearing President John F. Kennedy's inauguration address, where he asked that immortal question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I was, what, six years old? And I remember that question, Max. And I've seen some things that 
have concerned me for some time in our country, especially around young people. And I couldn't just keep shaking my head saying that's messed up. Yeah. So I asked myself, what could I do? And I found the answer, Max, in a very unlikely place. I found the answer in my old neighborhood, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, standing in front of the elementary school that I went to. And I saw the children coming and going out of the school doors. And it dawned on me, wait a minute. Oprah Winfrey and I are the same age, same zodiac sign, and went to the same elementary school. How do we know the next Chris Gardner, or more importantly, the next Oprah Winfrey, is not coming and going out of the same school boards and public schools all across the country right now? Mm -hmm. The truth is they are, Max. My job is to let them know that they can. Hence. I'm giving them permission to drink. So we're tremendously excited about it, Max. I'm doing this tour right now that's gonna have me speak at a thousand public schools. Start right there in your in your neighborhood, man, in LA. Hey. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so are you going to actually go to the schools in person and talk to them? Oh, you know what we had to do, Max. Back to your question earlier. How are you doing? No, man. We're using technology. Mm -hmm. We're doing it all virtually now. A couple of things. Sometimes when you're open to opportunities and possibilities, you're gonna see someone do something and that might be in a business totally unrelated to yours, Max, mm -hmm. but you'll see something, you'll say, that's it. I saw one of my favorite recording artists, Max, Andrea Bocelli, the great Italian tenor. I saw him sing Amazing Grace at the cathedral, El Domo, in Milan, Italy. The church was empty, but he sang like he was singing to the whole world. He went out onto the plaza. It was empty because of the lockdown, but he sang like he was singing again to the whole world. And I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. So I invested in the time, the team, and the technology that now allows me, last year, man, I spoke in 50 countries and never got on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> never got on a plane. And Max, now keep in mind, you're talking to a guy that for the last 12 years was 200 days on the road. Mm -hmm. But now I can do what I'm doing and reaching young people. And I'm doing it all using technology. Let's say this. I'll do a 30 minute pre recorded presentation. When I'm with young people, Max, I talk to them about the three most important decisions that I ever made in my life, all of which I made at their age or younger. Okay? Mm -hmm. And after that 30 minute presentation, I pop up live right here, right there where you are on that device, on your computer, yeah. on your laptop. And then we have live Q&A. Now, it's supposed to only be 15 minutes, but you know what happens? If you're having a good class, the kids don't want the class, the class to be over. Right? Yeah. The teacher's ringing the bell. The principal's ringing the bell. Okay, we got to go to the next class. And the kids are like, no, no, we got more questions. Yeah. All right. So I'm tremendously excited about it, Max. Again, a thousand schools is a big deal. But this is the time to be doing and daring big things, Max. It is. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your book. How was it like? Like, what was it like writing it? What was your process? <sighs> Painful. <laughs> Max, painful. Oh man, I'm never writing another book. Now this is my third <laughs> book. Okay, this is my third book. I'm not doing it again. Max, you have to like first of all think back. We're the final stages of getting everything done with the book in 2020 happens, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, you. 
you're trying to hear your own feelings. You're trying to hear what's in your own mind, but the world is going completely upside down. Yeah. Thank God we have most of the, the big pieces in place. So now we're at the point where we were just whittling away. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was a challenge, man. Um, the process of writing, I've, this is my third book with my co-author, Mim Eichler Rivas, who is an absolute genius. It's my third book with my editor, Tracy Sherrod at Amistad, HarperCollins. And my third book with my agent, Jennifer Gates. So it's like we got the band back together. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we're getting the band back together, baby. And we're going to do it one more time. Um, but this whole idea, Max, of again, having the opportunity to share with all people permission to dream, it's a big deal, bro. Yeah. You know, because there's no shortage of places and people that will tell you, Max, what can't be done. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen countless times. Yeah. All day, every day, Max. Yeah. Any source of media that you go to, somebody is telling you what can't be done. What's wrong? All right? Forget about it. It's over. Let me go back to something I said earlier. <clears throat> when I'm with young people in schools and talking about the fact that, again, Oprah and I, same age, same zodiac sign, in elementary school. And I say, I want to help create the next Chris Gardner's. I want to help create the next Oprah's. Adults have come to me and said, well, you can't, well, what are the odds of that happening again? I can't answer the question, Max, because I'm not focused on the odds. I'm focused on the evens. As in, even though, even if, even when, even where, even you, even me, this has been done before. But now it's our turn, Max. Yeah. It's been done before. Okay. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite people in the whole world, man, we could benefit from hearing her voice right now. When you come to Chicago, you see all those books on this shelf behind me. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I had a chance to ask my dear, dear, dear friend, Dr. Maya Angelou, if you could only read 100 books in your whole life, what should they be? She wrote me a list. That's what you see behind me. And I said all of that to say this. I'm reflecting right now on my last conversation with Dr. Angelou. And we were speaking about struggle. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget her saying to me, now this is years ago, Max. She said to me, we have the people for this mountain. We must all be mindful that there are people who came before us, who came up a steeper side of this mountain, carrying a bigger and heavier load with little to no opportunity, but they kept going forward, onward and upward. And still I rise. This has been done before, but now it's our turn. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we got this. We are the people for this mountain. <laughs> My aunt, Dr. Angela. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Man, let me tell you, that's a voice we could all benefit from hearing right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how old are you, Max? Let me ask you a question. How old are you? I'm 20. Okay. Let's do a timeline. What permission to dream is all about. Let's do a timeline. Let's go back 20 years. 20 years. Okay. The children born in the year 2000 were conceived in a storm, meaning the storm of 1999. We were all totally freaked out, Max, about something called Y2K. Yeah, do you remember that? You don't even remember that, do you? I heard about it. <laughs> you heard about it. Okay, trust me. Look, your parents, your grandparents, and I, 
we were all totally freaked out about Y2K. The fear was there was a glitch in the technology so that everything that used a microprocessor or a computer chip to function was going to fail. The banks were going to collapse, the utilities were going to fail, all government documents and records were going to be lost forever. So again, the children born in 2000 were conceived in the storm of 1999. Fast forward on that timeline, Max, one year, 2001, what happens? 9-11, fast forward seven years, what happens? Global financial crises. Fast forward 12 years, what happens? Politics, polarization, and a pandemic. What's the one constant in that timeline, Max? Change. Mm. Big, dramatic, frightening change. And I will submit to you, there's never been another generation of Americans better prepared to embrace, demand, or create change than your generation right now. Changes in your DNA, Bo. Mm -hmm. That's change is the only constant in my life, and I've right. accepted that. Change is here to stay, baby. So this whole idea, again, permission to dream, is about how do you adjust, adapt, and accept change. And you know, we were talking earlier about you know dreams not having expiration dates. And I've talked since we've been here a lot about young people and dreams. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? You can be my age and have dreams. I know I do, right? Uh, a lot of folks right now are having to reimagine their lives and rethink. And some folks, it's hard. I get it, it's hard. I know that, I've been there. But you think about some other people who pursued their dreams no matter how old they were. You know the name Ray Kroc? Do you know that name at all? No? I bet you've been to his restaurant. He started a little company called McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He started that when he was 56. John Pimbleton created Coca-Cola when he was 58. Harlan Sanders, also known as the Colonel, didn't sell his first piece of chicken until he was 62. Okay? Change and embracing opportunities and pursuing dreams. Dreams don't have expiration dates, bro. Unless you give them one on your own. Unless you create it. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important, Max, that we all give ourselves permission to dream. Yeah. And you I, know what? I, I just want to know, what's your zodiac sign? Aquarius. Aquarius. So Einstein and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know hey, anything could happen. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted your train of thought. I was just curious. How are you, how are you I was going to say, and I had to say this, Max, you know, there's some people in our country who don't get the respect or the acknowledgement that I think they should, that are going to make the difference as we continue to try and go forward. And I can never thank them enough. And I'm talking about our public school teachers. Mm -hmm. right. And, um, you know, somewhere in America right now, there's a, a doctor doing research that's going to cure a disease we haven't even heard of right now because a public school teacher totally mm -hmm. could. Somewhere in America right now, there's a lawyer getting ready to argue a case before the Supreme Court because a school teacher told her she could. Huh? Yeah. Somewhere in America right now, Max, somebody is doing something because a public school teacher told them they could. I know I was, I was one of those kids. Me too. <laughs> I was one of those kids, Max. I mean, dude, I wound up on Wall Street having to compete with people who went to Harvard for kindergarten. Yeah. Huh? But I was able to do so because I had public school teachers that told me I could. Mm -hmm. 
that was a again permission to dream so uh, anything that I can do to help a public school teacher uh, I'm there and we got work to do but we also some kind of a way we got to find a way to say thank you mm -hmm. to all the public school teachers all the education support personnel all the paraprofessionals that make our public school system work and folks go say a whole lot of stuff about what they want to say about public education but you know what it worked for me it worked yeah. Yeah. <laughs> worked for me bo i don't know what your problem is <laughs> i was in the same school you went to <laughs> but here we are yeah so what's one of the just if you had to have people remember one thing from the book just is permission to dream the one thing you would want them to know i want them to know that you've got to give yourself permission to dream and not be waiting for external validation mm. not be waiting for somebody else to say it's okay yeah no it's you don't if you wait for that max you'll be waiting a long time mm -hmm. Right? For young people, when I'm with them, Max, I stress to them a couple of things. Number one, this is not the time to disengage from your school, your teachers, or your education. This is the time to do school like a boss. B O S S. You got to be bold, opportunistic, strategic, and straight. Bold. The biggest bosses in any business or industry that you can think of, at some point in time, Max said, I need help. That's a bold admission. Opportunistic. This space that we're in right now, having to learn remotely, well, guess what? One day you might have to work remotely. Before that, you're going to have to interview remotely. You're going to have to compete for that internship remotely. This is the opportunity to master the new soft skills you got to demonstrate just to get in the game. Mm -hmm. Strategic. Keep your focus on your long game. We're going to be in this space longer than any of us would like. We are playing chess, not checkers. And straight. It's never going to change, Max, any place around the world. The quickest way from A to B is a straight line. Life's going to happen. Okay? Things are going to happen. But that trend line should always be going like this and straight. Yes, sir. It's okay to it's okay for the line to dip down a little bit, right? But as, hey, long, as long as the trend is up the whole time. Right? And the other thing about being straight. You got to say to yourself, I will not allow myself to be distracted. But most importantly, I will not allow myself to be a distraction to myself. Mm -hmm. So this is time to do school like a boss. So when are you when are you going to start uh, talking to elementary school kids? When does that oh, start? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Max, you know what? <laughs> oh, I'm glad you asked me that question. The folks at the Los Angeles County Office of Education said to me twice, we think you need to include elementary schools in this tour. Upper level elementary, fifth and sixth graders. Mm -hmm. I tried to avoid it, Max. Those people scare me to death, okay? Yeah. Those people, Max, they ask you big people questions and little people's bodies. <laughs> Right, like my granddaughter, like what's the difference between a dream and a plan? That's a big person question. We were on a call last couple of weeks ago, Max, with a school in Los Angeles, and a little boy just asked me a question, just out of nowhere. He wanted to know, Mr. Gardner, when you were a little boy, were you ever afraid to go home? That's a big question, Max. Yeah. And, and he didn't just ask that question just out of curiosity. So we had to have a real discussion about it, man. The truth of the matter is, uh, the facts are no one talks about it. 
but domestic violence and child abuse numbers have skyrocketed as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We had to have a discussion about being bold and letting someone else know that you need help. The cool thing is, as a result of that conversation, uh, the principal now knows maybe we need to take a little bit closer look at this young man's environment and see how we can help him. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're including uh, upper level elementary schools and it's kind, of, it's kind of funny. There's another part of the school system that we're also including. We're including uh, young people in Los Angeles. The rest of the world calls these young people who are involved with the justice system at risk. In LA, we call them at promise. <clears throat> and talking with young people who are incarcerated, involved with the justice system, but still going to school. Let me tell you something, man. You have a real, a whole different conversation with somebody who's locked up in prison than you do someone who's confined to the bedroom due to the lockdown and pandemic. Yeah. You have a whole different conversation, man. So, yeah, um, yeah man, here we go. Here we go. Um, tremendously excited about it. And to have started this in Los Angeles, a lot of people don't know this, but both of my children were born in California. Okay, my son up in San Francisco, my daughter in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the idea to start my business 35 years ago was born at the Los Angeles Public Library. Really? Oh man, the Spalding Branch up on Sunset in Detroit, Spalding Park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And Max, look, okay, now this is prehistoric for you, I know. <laughs> but where there was no internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? And if you wanted to know something, Max, you had to go to the public library. They had the periodicals, the journals, the research materials, and everything that I needed to begin to formulate this idea of how do I start my own firm on Wall Street? Mm -hmm. So LA is important to me. It's not just, oh, I'm just happy to be here. No, there's a reason. Can you see me? No, but I can hear you, sir. Oh, you just, you were talking and you froze for a second. Yeah, sorry about sorry. that. <clears throat> I was gonna say Los Angeles is very, very important to me. Yeah, me too. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, so does anyone in the audience have any specific questions? If you do, go ahead and put them in the chat. If not, we'll probably go ahead and wrap up soon. But Chris, I'll leave you with one more question. Mm. What one question do you always wish you were asked? Mm. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? I'm afraid of disappointing the angels that sit on my shoulders. Mm. I've got some angels. All these people behind me, those photos you see, they sit on my shoulders, Max, and, and they see everything that I do, and I act like it. <laughs> All right? I'm afraid of disappointing my angels. That's my greatest fear. And... Um, that's why this time is so important to me right now to be doing my best work. And uh, my best work means it's not about me and it's bigger than me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm making a direct investment in the future of this country, sir. And um, I believe in young people like you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to pass the baton here. So we do have one question from the audience. From mm -hmm. she asked, "What is the hard, hardest pivot you've had to make?" I lost the love of my life to brain cancer nine years ago. 
and to go from being best friend, lover, soulmate, partner in crime, to primary caregiver. That was the hardest pivot I ever had to make in my life, Max. But I now know it was also the greatest honor that I ever got in my life. Mm -hmm. I will submit to you, sir, the greatest honor you'll ever have is to have someone that you love know I'll be there. Don't know what these doctors are going to say. I'll be there. Yeah. Don't know what that x-ray is going to say. I'll be there. Okay. Don't know what that MRI is going to say. I'll be there. And I will submit to you, sir, that would be the greatest honor you ever have in your life. And it won't feel like it until you get way down the road. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are now. So we have another question from Lisa. She says, what have you learned about your writing process from your first to third book? Was it harder the third time? Uh, uh, it yeah, gets harder. Your writing process. <laughs> it gets harder. You know why it gets harder? Because you got so much more stuff in your head now and so much more stuff in your heart now. But you know what? I learned something from my, my big brother, my godfather, uh, Quincy Jones. Uh, Quincy knows a little bit of something about how you put stuff together, right? And he, I'll never forget him saying to me, man, you got to put all that in a blender. All your love, all your pain, all your fears, and you got to put that all in a blender and then you got to let it flow. It's got to fit, feel, and flow. Those are his exact words. And I don't know if you ever met Quincy, but you know he's got 27 Grammys. <laughs> that's, that's my dream, honestly. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. So he knows a little something about the blender. <laughs> you know a little something about yeah. fit, feel, and flow. Yes, sir. Um, so Marsha is asking a question. She asked, Chris, could you please tell us three big personal dreams of yours? You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to give you one. The biggest one right now? Yeah. This whole idea of permission to dream. If we gave everyone in America right now permission to dream, we would probably all max dream of the same thing. We would dream of being able to be with our loved ones and our families. We would probably put a lot of this other stuff on the side for a little, for a little while and just have that permission to dream and be with our families. Uh, this pandemic, Max, I haven't seen my grandbaby in a year. And that breaks my heart every day. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, last summer, I went to the gym, and there was a young man, Max, riding his bicycle through the parking lot. Because of the lockdown, he couldn't go anywhere else, so he's riding through the, the parking lot between the cars, over the speed bumps, popping wheelies. And I stopped him just for a second. And I said, young man, if you could go anywhere in the world on that bicycle right now, where would you go? He said, I ride to Massachusetts to see my grandparents. Man, I almost cried because my granddaughter lives in Massachusetts. <laughs> huh? And that just confirms what I just said. And we could give everybody in America and all around the world right now permission to dream, Max. We were dreaming the same thing. And that would be to be able to be with our family and the people that we love. Yeah, I've, I've missed my grandparents so much. This oh, past. <laughs> man. I know exactly the feeling. It got me messed up. Oh, Max, come on, man. Come on, the last minute. <laughs> Stop. Sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, so permission to dream, baby. And um, if I could give everybody in America one thing, that would be it, bro. And I will say this to you. I believe as we go forward, Max, this is about to be the biggest comeback in the history of comebacks. Mm -hmm. If we do this right and we all go together, we're coming back, baby, and this thing is going to be bigger than Rocky Balboa. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know so. And Max, and I'm counting on you to be in the front. You and your generation leading the charge. I'm counting on you. And now I'm there for backup. <laughs> no, we'll put you at the front. You can be at the very front. <laughs> Man, I got to tell you, Max, it's been absolutely the greatest thing I've done all day. Yeah, it's so been a pleasure. Thank you. It is no, thank you. And anybody out there, look, permission to dream. If you're going to pick up a copy, stop by Foreman's, okay? And independent bookstores small bookstores. Uh, I'm doing everything that I can to push as many books as I can through shops like yours, Max. Thank you. Okay. There's a place for the big houses. Yeah. The other folks, there's a place for them. But this is where we can all kind of, you know what, by choice, we can put our money where our mouth is and support the small business people. That's part of permission to dream. All right, brother. Awesome. I can't thank you enough, man. Yeah, you. I've had such a good time. Thank you, Chris. And thank no, you, everyone, for joining and listening to us talk. For oh, thank you, everybody. Yeah. And you know, Max, one day soon, my dream, one of my other dreams, okay? <clears throat> I used to have this program called Hug a Reader. I want to bring that back. And I want to be able to hug everybody on the planet who's ever read any of my work. So Dude, bring it back. Well, we, first of all, we got to get cleaned up. <laughs> we got to be able to hug, yeah. All right, so right now I'm giving you a big socially distance Ooh. virtual hug. Oh! Uh, all right, baby. We'll see uh, you soon, Max. I'm out. Have a good night.